Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Let me read the first two verses. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. This is Galilee. This is the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. First thing we see about this passage is that Jesus invites the most unlikely people to the journey. Jesus invites the most unlikely people to the journey. This is a big deal that Jesus calls Levi. Levi is a tax collector. We know Levi, uh, uh, we will know Levi later as Matthew, one of the gospel writers. And again, we have to understand uh, how this would be received by the first century Christians toward the end of the first century in the, in the 60s. Of the first century, we, we, if we were those who were reading this for the first time, we would see Levi knowing that Levi was Matthew. And we would be listening with interest, right? Wondering, well, just as we wondered about Simon Peter following Jesus as a fisherman who dropped his nets, so we find out here about Levi, who would become Matthew. Levi was a tax collector. And the people reading this in the first century would be wondering what Jesus' response is when he sees a tax collector sitting at the tax collector's booth. And Jesus' response to him, his invitation is, follow me. Just like he did with Andrew and Simon and James and John, follow me. Jesus invites the most unlikely people to the journey. And they were, Levi was unlikely because tax collectors were hated by their own people. Tax collectors would have been people hired, wealthy people hired by the Roman government to collect taxes from their peers. Now, they were responsible for any shortages, so they're never going to uh, cut a deal with anyone. They want to watch out for themselves, make sure they have plenty to give to the government. And the taxes that were collected uh, by the tax collectors that went to Herod not only went to building things that benefited the Jewish people, but also went towards building pagan temples. And so there was this sense of, what, what am I paying these taxes for? I don't know if you've ever had that thought go through your mind. <laughs> but not only was it, you think, gee, that doesn't seem like it's a very important endeavor, but it might even be an evil endeavor or an a, a, a unspiritual endeavor or something against God. If you were reading this in the first century, you'd say, okay, what is Jesus going to do with this tax collector? Certainly not him. There was good reason for the Jewish people to believe that there were certain people who were welcomed and certain people who were not. This week in our, our reading through the Psalms, Psalm 15 says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? That's a good question. Who would be welcomed into your presence? God, who do you allow to enter into your house? That's a good question. And if we were to ask that question today, are there a list of people that you would think would not be welcomed into God's house? I mean, just, if you were to just list certain number kinds of people, are there, is there a list that you would create? The psalmist says, Who may live on your holy mountain? Those who lend money to the poor without interest and do not accept bribes against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. In other words, there are people uh, who do wrong who would never be accepted into God's holy mountain, into His sanctuary. And there are those who do right who would be welcomed. There's good reason why the Jewish people, God's people, would believe that some would be welcomed and some were not. So it's understood in their time that the tax collector was, was despised by his own people. This is scandalous that Jesus invites Levi to follow him. We have to understand that. To, to see this story unfold, we have to see that this is scandalous. So I want you to take of the list of people that you or others might think would not be welcomed into God's sanctuary, into his house. I want you to take that list and just picture someone. The most scandalous person to be welcomed into God's house. You have to understand that kind of of feeling, that kind of conviction that isn't just a thought, but deep down in your heart, this should not be so. 
Look at verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house. Okay, so first of all, he asked him to follow him, and now he invites him to dinner. Okay, the plot thickens. <laughs> While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors, many, you can circle many, tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw Jesus eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples. They didn't ask Jesus. Isn't that interesting? You can see them off to the side asking the disciples, so tell me, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. There were many who followed him. And Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Second point from this passage is that hospitality is a tangible sign of the kingdom of God. Jesus invites sinners, tax collectors, and others to eat with him at table. Table fellowship was an, a mark of intimacy. It's intimate relationships with those who shared it. The Pharisees were particularly uh, specific about who might eat with them. This was a big deal. They would never have eaten. They had special rules on who they ate with and how they ate. And they would never have eaten with tax collectors or sinners. Especially tax collectors. Here, they're assuming that Jesus holds their same convictions. But Jesus welcomes the tax collectors and sinners into fellowship that he has established with the disciples. I think this is an interesting image. Jesus called certain people to follow him. And as they came into relationship with him, they formed a fellowship with each other. They got to know each other. They formed a small group with each other. And so they began to journey together. And as they journey with each other, and they're, they're actually journeying, walking, learning, these disciples are apprentices. Jesus is the rabbi, the teacher. And as they're walking together, their lives are being changed because of the intimacy they're sharing with each other. They begin to tell their stories with each other. They find out they have some similarities. They, they find out that they thought they were the one who wouldn't be welcomed into the kingdom. And they find out the other one was the thought, one that thought they wouldn't be welcomed into the kingdom. Here are all these tax collectors who are all kind of surprised. I mean, kind of looking at each other like, you know, this is their first time in the small group meeting. And go, wait, you were invited too? You got invited to this party? Hey, I know, why are we here? I thought he was a rabbi. Here they are journeying together, and they begin to have this sense of gratitude and grace toward each other and, toward, and gratitude towards Jesus and understanding that they've been welcomed. No one else in their society would have welcomed them, and yet this Jesus welcomes them into fellowship. Now here they are journeying together, and they're, they're healing the sick. They're seeing Jesus do these amazing things. And now there's a chance for them to have kind of a party. Right? When, two years ago when we talked about walking across the room, we talked about throwing a Matthew party where you take your friends uh, who are followers of Christ and invite friends who are not followers of Christ into a party setting where they're able to interact with each other and get a glimpse of what it means to have Christian fellowship. That's what Jesus does here. He takes the intimacy of their gathering as as disciples, intimacy of their gathering, and now they invite others to experience what they've experienced with Jesus. And so here, many tax collectors and sinners come to Levi's house. I, I think this is a, a wonderful bridge to the community. When we think of making a connection to the community around us, think of, think of Levi and you think, well, gee, who should I invite? I don't know anyone religious. You know, when you think about who you're going to invite to a dinner party, right? The pastor's coming over. Who are the most religious people that I can invite <laughs> to come over? 
because I don't want to be embarrassed. I want them to see that I've got really religious friends. So Levi is thinking this, who am I going to invite? I have no one to invite. I don't know anybody. I'm the only person I know who's following Jesus. And I can see Jesus saying to him, no, 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 invite your friends. That's who I want to meet. I want to meet your friends. Yeah, but you don't know my friends. No, no, I know your friends. I want you to invite your friends. That's why I've come. You see, I've come for those who are sick, who need a doctor. I haven't come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous, to call sinners to myself. And so I'm not going to meet sinners unless you invite them. And so here's this big party. And hospitality of Jesus becomes a tangible sign of the kingdom that he came to introduce. Hospitality. Welcoming. Inviting. There's nothing like being invited as a stranger into someone else's home and experiencing hospitality. When we were on sabbatical in 1997, we were traveling through Europe and we were traveling through uh, France and Amy and I and the boys were 10 years old at the time, almost 10, in fourth grade. And we were kind of conspicuous uh, traveling around together. We'd always, uh, people would always ask us questions. And there was uh, one time we were in a, a restaurant together and we were sitting there in, in uh, this little town uh, in between Lyon and Dijon in, in, uh, in the, there on the <laughs> east, south thing, in a little place called Oton. And we're in this restaurant and none of us read or write or speak French and we're just trying to read through the menu and talk about feeling like an outsider, a stranger. And so the waiter comes over and he's like, yeah, you know, okay, that must, that's a pig, that's good, that's pork, uh, you know, moo, okay, that's a cow, that's a beef, okay, that's good, uh, ch chicken, make all these sounds, fish, it's like, sounds like three things. And so he, we order and, and we're kind of nervous and of course it doesn't matter what you order because you know, you can't read what any of the sauces are. You have no idea how it's prepared. So it didn't matter. It might as well, give me anything. Just throw it. Just give it to me. It doesn't matter. I don't care. And it's like, well, that's interesting. I, okay, well, we eat it. And a woman came over to our table. Her name was Brigitte. And, and she came over to our table, tall, thin woman. And she says, excuse me, uh, may I speak with you in English? I said, well, that, yes, uh, sure. And she says, I was an exchange student in Northern California uh, when I was in high school. I would love to just speak English with you. And so she sat down with us and talked for like 20 minutes. Her boyfriend, who was a, a kind of a, a mix, he was kind of a mix between uh, George Costanza from Seinfeld and um, Woody Allen, and <laughs> very short, tall, and uh, she sat with us for 20 minutes and he was over there with another couple and finally they came over like, okay, it's 11 o'clock, can we go? And so she says, would you come back to my apartment? I'm like, uh, okay, Amy, what do you think? Is that good? We got boys, 11 o'clock, yes, we'll go. Go back to her apartment. She owned the bookstore in town, this little village. She owned the bookstore, she had the apartment up above. And so we sat there and, and watched while uh, they drank large amounts of something, I don't know what it was, and smoked and smoked and smoked, and the boys fell asleep, and we talked and talked about two in the morning. She says, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, well, I don't know. We just got here. She says, would you like to have dinner at my mother's home? And we said, well, now we're thinking, okay, this is how people get abducted and something. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, we'll talk to you tomorrow. So we come back to her bookstore and we said, well, we have to say yes, right? You have to say yes, right? Who would say yes to that? Okay, you have to say yes. So Juju and Brigitte pick us up. Juju and Brigitte pick us up in their two cars because they don't have a car big enough for all of us. So they drive us out of the country. We're driving through this country road and past this chateau. And here's this farmhouse that has been uh, renovated into her home. And we go into the house. And not only was it her mother who was there, but her siblings were there. And her father, who's deceased, his best friend, and all of his children. This was a family reunion. They were inviting us to. And we sat there at the table, and Amy and I, Brigitte's the only one who speaks English, and so she's translating everything. We're just watching everything. The boys go upstairs and play with the kids. We're watching this, and I'm sitting next to 
the mother, the grandmother, I've just become, like, we've become the guests of honor at this. And we were just overwhelmed. And me and I keep kicking ourselves under the table. Can you believe this? This food is unbelievable. This place came out of a magazine. And we've been welcomed into their home. We became family with them. There is something about welcoming the stranger that is a sign of the kingdom. Now, what was interesting was she asked why we were there. And I, and I had to translate. This is hard. You know, you don't want to say, you want to say everything in about half sentences. So uh, my, my mother would like to know why you're here. Well, we're traveling through Europe. I'm on sabbatical. Oh, why are you on sabbatical? I'm a, I'm a minister. A minister? Is that like a priest? Well, sort of. So no, he just, she was Catholic, wants to know why a priest has children. It was all very confusing. <laughs> and she says, the mother says, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. I believe in this. I believe in love and family. I said, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm the guest of this. I'm, I, I, I wasn't going to have a debate with her at this table. She just fed me. I said, you know, I believe, I believe in this too. I just believe this is a gift from God. And that was, that was it. That was all we did. <laughs> but there's something about being welcomed into someone's home. Being the stranger who's welcomed in. And I... And I, Jesus knew that hospitality was an important sign of the kingdom of God. That where there is hospitality, where there is a welcoming of the stranger, the kingdom of God is somehow being demonstrated. So the story goes on. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting and yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day they will fast. See, the, the, no one would fast during a wedding feast. If you were fasting, you would break your fast. Go celebrate with everyone. You'd celebrate with the bridegroom. You wouldn't fast. You wouldn't go to a, a wedding with sackcloth and ashes. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make a big deal about your own spiritual uh, discipline. You would go and you would celebrate. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If they do, the new piece will, be, will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And people do not pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Hospitality is the new invitation to experience Jesus. Hospitality is the new invitation to experiencing Jesus. John's disciples... And the Pharisees were fasting. And it would be expected that if the rabbi was fasting, the disciples would be fasting. And so here the Pharisees and John's disciples were fasting. And fasting was not required in their culture uh, every day, often. Fasting was required on the Day of Atonement. Other times would be added times of fasting. That, uh, that a rabbi would institute in order for his followers to be able to practice that, that spiritual discipline. The Pharisees used, I believe, used fasting as a way of separating themselves from the ordinary person. It would be easy for, for a Pharisee and their followers to walk through town and everyone notice that they were fasting, right? They could visibly tell that they're fasting, which is sort of a, a separation. As soon as you know that they're fasting, well, stay away from them. Give them their space. They're fasting. Look how religious they are. I could never do that. Now, sometimes as Christians, we do a similar thing. We practice our spiritual disciplines in front of others, or we, we, uh, we create unnecessary barriers that are religious. Like, scheduling our lives so much around church activities that we don't have time to spend with people in our lives who don't know Christ. And our reputation among our friends is that we're extremely busy and we don't have time. There's no space in our lives for hospitality. And Jesus says, look, 
There's a time to feast and there's a time to fast. While my disciples are with me right here, we're feasting together and we're inviting others to join us in this feast because there's a, a time to celebrate. Jesus uses these examples of the old uh, cloth and the old wineskins, the new cloth and the new wineskins. And that there has to be a, a new wineskin, there has to be a new vehicle for the new wine. There has to be a new vehicle for the new faith, the new way of experiencing the kingdom. And Jesus is saying the new way of experiencing the kingdom is not by separating ourselves from the world, but by inviting the world to participate in our fellowship. And I think this is an ancient way that became new, and this is a, a, a new way that has become new. In other words, I believe Jesus wants us to recapture this sense of a new invitation, a new experience of, of experiencing Jesus. That we see hospitality as an opportunity for us to extend the kingdom of God by inviting others to participate with us. That's why I'm, I, I believe one of the aspects of our small group ministry that is so vital is that we, on a weekly basis, experience the discipline, which just means we do it on a regular basis, of hospitality, welcoming people into our homes. And I think if it were not for that, we would be much more isolated people within our church family. Now, there are other ways for us to do that besides our small groups. So other fellowship groups, other friendships, inviting people over for dinner. But I think at times, what would Amy and my life be like if we did not spend every week, one evening, eating with our small group? What stories would we, what would we not know? What lives would we not be engaged in? What people would we not be able to pray for? What learning would not have taken place in our own lives if we had not heard each other's stories and, and heard each other's perspective on Scripture and, and just being in each other's presence? We have dinner every week together in our small group, which is kind of a chore, but it's kind of fun. And it just allows for no agenda, no curriculum, no questions, just time around the table, getting caught up with each other. We are experiencing a tangible sign of the kingdom of God in our table fellowship with each other. Now, when we extend that to those outside of, of uh, our community of faith, we, we, uh, we practice a new experience of Jesus. You see, because the world around us thinks that what Christians do better than anyone else is create barriers and walls. And what Jesus says is, I've come for sinners. I've come for people who don't know me. So introduce me to your friends. Well, who should I invite over? Gee, introduce me to your friends. I want to know who your friends are. And I want your friends to know me. I don't know what your surprise experience of hospitality has been in your life. But I do believe that hospitality is a way for us to surprise people with the kingdom of God, the generosity and love of the Father. I love this uh, two, scripture, two quotes here that I want to read for you. Uh, one is from Parker Palmer. Hospitality is a way of receiving each other. Our struggles, our newborn ideas with openness and care, it means creating an ethos, an environment in which the community of faith can form. And then Karen Maines says, the essence of hospitality is a heart open to God with room prepared for the guestness of the Holy Spirit that welcomes the presence of Christ. This is what we share with those to whom we open our doors. We give them Him. So I want you to think about the opportunities that we have as a community of faith to offer hospitality. I want you to think about what happens when you get out of your car each Sunday morning and come to the sanctuary and the opportunities that you have along the way to extend hospitality to each other. When you come into the sanctuary and you look for the seat that you paid for, <laughs> that has your name on it, and there's someone who is looking for a seat, or there's someone who is alone and doesn't have any to sit with, I want you to think about a new experience 
of Jesus would be for that person to be welcomed into your pew or maybe for you to move and allow them to take your space. But you think about your week and the opportunities that you have, whether in the workplace and inviting someone to lunch or in your own home, inviting someone else. Last week we talked about those in our lives, in our community who are isolated. One way for us to deal with those, to respond to those who are isolated in our community is by offering hospitality. And it isn't just having people over and making sure that everything is right, because hospitality in Scripture, the discipline of hospitality, isn't making sure that you have all the right china and silverware and you make just a fabulous meal and people say, Gee, I just don't have the gift of hospitality. That's not what this is talking about. This is opening our hearts, making room for the other, entering into their story, welcoming them into our homes, having a cup of coffee, being willing to enter in to the story of the stranger and making them feel like they're the guest of honor, making them feel like they're the ones for whom this whole feast was planned. Jesus invites us. And when we realize that we are the sinners that he came for and our lives are filled with gratitude to him, we realize that that gratitude, that grace is meant to be extended to others in our lives. Hospitality is the new experience of Jesus. It's a new invitation to experience Jesus in a new way. Let's be people who practice hospitality. Let me pray for us. Jesus, we thank you that you, in amazing ways, invited the most unlikely people to follow after you. We realize that we are some of those people. Some of us never thought that we'd be following you at this time in our lives, that we'd still be following you, that we'd begin to follow you. But we recognize your hand of grace and your invitation. And so we're grateful that you have invited us to follow you. We pray Jesus, that in the days and weeks and years ahead, that when people think of this congregation, they'll think of hospitality. When they think of us as individuals or as couples or as families, they would think of hospitality. Forgive us for filling our lives with so many activities that we don't have room for the other. We don't have room for the stranger. Help us to practice hospitality with each other. Help us to step out of our comfort zone and enter into the story of the other. Jesus, we ask for your grace to fill our lives. We pray that there would be a spirit of hospitality and welcoming in this congregation and in our homes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.